Well, I think um, the particular new thing, the particular point about my book, why someone should read it if you, if you put it um, like that, is I think particularly in the English-speaking world, um, everybody with the fall of Napoleon, everybody's focused on the Battle of Waterloo and 1815 with obviously the bicentenary um, next year. Um, and I feel that this completely ignores the fact that Waterloo wasn't in fact that important to the fall of Napoleon. When he fought Waterloo, he'd already had to abdicate once. He was returning to France as an adventurer and as an outlaw, in fact. And had he won the Battle of Waterloo, he would only have been defeated um, a few months down the line by a second Allied army. Um, whereas for me, it's the two years before that, 1813 and 1814, um, that is the key moment in his fall, because in 1813 and 1814, he really had something to lose. He was still emperor of the French. He still had a huge empire um, comprising most of Germany and Italy. And it was his extraordinary obstinacy in refusing to negotiate even after his major military defeat in the retreat from Moscow that really doomed him. So the key fact, the key, the key um, aspect of his fall, I think the key events leading to his fall are those of 1813 and 1814, leading up to his first abdication in April 1814. I think one of the main reasons why this period in Napoleon's fall is neglected is that it's sandwiched basically, between two major events. In the beginning of the retreat from Moscow that everybody more or less knows about as a huge military and human disaster. And on the other hand, um, later on, particularly from the British point of view, Napoleon's defeat by Wellington in 1815 at the Battle of Waterloo. And I think it's a lot of it's linked up with British national pride, the fact that Napoleon's last great battle, his last defeat, is at the hands of a British commander of Wellington and of a more or less British army. Now, the reason I think that no British people really have looked up to now and there hasn't been much British interest in the period 1813 and 1814, is basically that no British commanders took part in this and no British troops took part in this. Now, on the one hand, there was the British army in 1813 and 1814, fresh from the Peninsular War, marching up through the Pyrenees and invading southern France by the spring of 1814. And the British troops under Wellington did get as far as Toulouse. So in that sense, a British army was involved in the defeat of Napoleon. But the real fighting when Napoleon himself was involved, and when Napoleon himself and his main armies were defeated, was in Germany and in eastern France moving towards Paris. And here, there were no British troops involved at all. Um, there was Napoleon on the one hand, and the Austrians, the Russians, and the Prussians on the other. Um, and the major battle here, which really sealed Napoleon's fate, or certainly the fate of his empire, was the Battle of Leipzig in October 1813. This is a three-day battle, which is the bloodiest battle in world history until the first day of the Somme. Um, hundreds of thousands of people um, are, killed, are killed and wounded during it. But as far as the British are concerned, there is only one British unit that's involved in the Battle of Leipzig, and that is a rocket battery um, under a very gallant Captain Bogue, um, who's actually killed in the course of the battle, very heroically. But that's no, that, that, that isn't participation on the scale of Wellington at Waterloo. And I think that's why um, the British have tended to neglect and gloss over this period, 1813, 1814, because apart from a, what you might call a sideshow in Spain, southwest France, the heavy fighting, the heavy lifting, the real fighting is being done by non-British troops and non-British commanders.